Okay, this uh, is the maquette for a sculpture recently completed for the Royal Academy Summer Exhibition. I'm a Royal Academy and I'm allowed to put a certain number of pieces in to the uh, exhibition. And uh, I had a couple of quite large blocks of uh, Egyptian uh, alabaster sitting here maybe for five years. And I decided that that was what I was going to uh, work on. Um, for the exhibition. And I had an idea about the simplicity with cycladic figures, the sort of a minimalism almost, of how little one needs to do to stone to make it figurative. A part of my project for the last 25 to 30 years, really, has been to see how I can handle or work with the figure in the same kind of way that I worked with surface before and narrative later, and specifically the idea of how little one needs to do to something to make, make a figure. The Cycladic figures from about two and a half to three thousand BC, I suppose, um, are often triangular figures with very, very little in terms of uh, identifying marks, but just enough to suggest head, just enough to suggest sexuality, or whichever figure, just enough to suggest arms. Um, and here is actually a true maquette because uh, this piece here was a piece that I made of the two pieces that were once joined together, as were the two big sculptures, which are one meter ninety, so they're over six foot six high, and they were cut and opened out to evidence the matching nature of the fingerprints of the two halves of the sculpture. So you can see that we have a mirror here of these mm. shapes in the sculpture. So they're called Cycladic Gemini. So they're twins. And twins are a theme that I've been working on for some time now in different types of stone. And um, particularly in uh, Hammermat Breccia, which is highly marked and striated and occasionally dramatic enough to really make a double whammy out of the way that the pages of the stone have been unfolded to mm. create a story of the stone's making. And I suppose increasingly from, you know, whether it was Romulus or Remus or Castor and Pollux, even the idea of uh, Adam and Eve um, can be drawn into the idea of twins or twinning. And so um, having made this piece originally. I then, because of time constraints, proceeded to make the big sculpture using this as a model. And then when the sculpture was sent off to, uh, to London for the exhibition, I was able to come back and complete, if you like, the pairing of these two pieces and finding another base of this particular type of Egyptian alabaster. Egyptian alabaster is not uh, like the gypsum or of English alabaster, which was used in the medieval period for making many tomb sculptures, uh, and used in Italy in a different form, of white alabaster, which was also used for decorative uh, purposes predominantly, but I think also uh, some sculptural uh, examples exist. Um, but this is often referred to as calcite. It's also referred to as a, uh, a travertine because of the kind of... Uh, recesses or the kind of organic matter that stops mm. these things being joined together. My own feeling is that with this particular material, there's n there hasn't been any organic matter in here. The evidence of the material that's often found in the holes and in the sculpture in, uh, in London, and in this piece here, this sample, um, you can see the kind of sand this is a kind of a desert sand, I oh, suppose, yeah. or a sea sand, which is so deep in some recesses. Uh, and sometimes it's all sort of thick enough to almost be like clay. So you do have this kind of um, uh, curious colouring which occurs uh, within the recesses of these um, open types of, uh, of alabaster. So although it's Egyptian alabaster and Cyclades, if you like, run off from, from uh, Egypt and I suppose carry certain ideas of the development of, um, of sculpture from the, from the sort of monolithic dimensionality of a pharaoh seen from the front, seen from the side and carved 
in a way that I've worked in India as well with Basel, in this kind of frontal approach to sculpture. You have the cycladic things which are often con uh, uh, contemporary with very early Egyptian sculpture, but also you get the kind of transition from there through to Greece with Koros, mm. uh, which also begin to show a kind of a movement for the first time from these rather more static, sort of statuesque, sort of uh, flat, non-dynamic pieces, but profoundly rich with uh, an amazing uh, tactility mm. and prim primariness um, uh, of sort of sculptural expression. I'm just going to come around to show the, the wonderful texture on the rear here too. Uh, this is uh, interesting yeah. as well because in a highly marked stone, although you have here at the interface where the stone has been cut, you have the mirroring, but you can see here that you have a totally different kind of figuration mm. on the back here and on the back here, which has very, very little relationship through, although you might say that these shapes have a little bit of a relationship to each other, uh, but the kind of structure of the material, this is very much more kind of pure, unmarked, sort of a solid alabaster in here it sort of shows a kind of a transitional form of the material as it changes from being highly marked to being rather more cons consistent and here i'm still playing around with an idea of perhaps of hair right and the line becoming which is often the case you'll see like uh, the legs Right. Separation of legs yeah. in, in a, a cycladic work. So I might still develop this line on both pieces to make this sort of dedication to the uh, cycladic forms. Just like Peregrine, Sentinel, um, and Dreadnought uh, from our last module, I wanted to bring in Stephen Cox discussing his own work before discussing it in a little bit more detail myself. And in the interview that uh, you just saw with Stephen talking about uh, this work, Gemini, um, he's talking about the, the working model for the piece. And that's what you see here. This is a scale model in the material he planned to use of the finished work of Gemini. But this is not the actual work itself. This is uh, sort of a mock-up, um, a much smaller version of that same sculpture. And uh, I want you to recall that he talks about uh, the importance of the fact that both of these come from the same stone and that the fronts really sort of belong together. Uh, on the left, I'm showing you kind of a, a three-quarter view of the front of the pieces. And then on the right, I'm showing you a closer view of the backs. And you can see that the backs really diverge a great deal uh, in these two sculptures, in the, in the maquette or model version. Here's another closer view of that maquette of Gemini. Uh, which of course is uh, a reference to the twins. And I think you can appreciate just how monumental these relatively small models appear. And I think that's because of the extreme solidity of them and the real attention to treating the stone as stone and appreciating the patterning in that stone. Uh, you can see here how, for example, uh, some holes and pitting in this alabaster, this is Egyptian alabaster, um, have become kind of like mouths in the, the sort of head portion of these two figures. Um, and then we have these uh, chests with uh, protruding nipples on, on either one. Um, and that also seems to, re to uh, refer to some of the patterning in the stone. And remember with, with uh, Peregrine Sentinel and also with Dreadnought, uh, Stephen is working in conversation with his materials. He's responding to what he finds as he sculpts, as he works.
Here's our last look at the maquette or model for Gemini and you can see some of the differentiation between uh, sort of the breasts or nipples on these figures. Uh, you can see some of Stephen's pencil marks here and maybe get a slightly better appreciation for uh, the surface that he's working with and also the way that he's treating it. Um, he's roughing out these forms and not making them perfectly smooth the way that uh, we're going to see in the finished works on display in the Royal Academy. Now we're looking at the finished large-scale version of Stephen Cox's Gemini. Uh, this is like the maquette, made out of uh, Egyptian alabaster. And I think that you can see here maybe a little bit more clearly that we have a male figure and a female figure. Uh, you can tell that if you look at about midpoint on both of them. On the right, the figure has something that projects at roughly where the, the groin would be. And on the right, we have uh, a hollow area at that same point on the sort of female figure. Um, you can also see uh, how the, the, the chests on both of them uh, have similar markings on them. And you can see how Stephen took this uh, area of uh, where, where the, the stone had kind of broken down and uh, decayed a little bit and discolored and really made that into a feature uh, on the breast of each one of these figures. Uh, kind of turning that area into almost sort of like a breastplate or something. Um, just like with the maquette, these two enormous figures, which are uh, over five feet high, as I recall from when I was in the gallery, um, they are carved from the exact same block. And if you take a look at the patterning on this front side of the two figures, um, it's roughly, you, you can tell that they were sort of split down uh, from, the same, from the same area. So they almost mirror each other um, in their patterns. And this is uh, quite deliberate. And it's wonderful the way that they seem to kind of respond to each other. Uh, in terms of the patterning in this Egyptian alabaster. Here on the left, we're looking at the rear of the two figures. And on the right, you're seeing uh, the full front of one of them kind of in three quarter view, and then just a sliver of the other. Um, and I think again, you can see just how Stephen is taking advantage of the intricacy and the amazing patterns in that alabaster. This is a sculpture that is as much about the alabaster as it is Stephen shaping that alabaster. And I think you can clearly see that sort of conversation that he is uh, engaged in with his materials and also his interest in uh, is kind of exploring the, the, the patterns and the ways that these two figures respond to each other um, since they're coming from the same block. Uh, you should notice that as on the maquette, the backs of these two figures are quite different while the fronts have a lot more similarities um, in their patterns. Now we're looking at a closer view of the, the figure that I uh, called the male figure earlier. And you can see again, just the, the, the wonderful way in which Stephen is utilizing uh, what would be considered sort of imperfections in the stone, areas where there, the stone has been uh, worn away by weathering, by oxidation, and, and so on, and uh, really turning these into features of the stone rather than imperfections. Um, it shows a real response to these materials uh, that I think is characteristic of all of his work.
Here's our last slide, and I just want you to notice again how different the backs of these two figures are. Um, I mean, they're both absolutely gorgeous, and you can see uh, kind of the, the way that the patterns flesh out on both sides for these figures. Uh, it's really fascinating to look at these works and, and also to compare them to that maquette because the maquette, as, as complex as it is, um, you don't get all of the same large patterning that you do here in this uh, nearly life-size example of Gemini. Um, and it, it truly is a magnificent work. I wonder, and this is something that I probably should have asked him when I was uh, at his studio in the Ludlow area, but I find myself wondering if he would be willing to have something like this uh, be placed out in the elements, because I think that weathering, uh, and of course, you know, if, if it were in a city with acid rain and things like that, would uh, affect these two figures in very different ways. Um, and so they would sort of change and, and morph over time. Uh, that, that's probably something that's never going to happen. I would imagine these would be purchased by a collector or a museum uh, and housed indoors away from harm's way, particularly given uh, the fact that alabaster can be somewhat fragile um, when exposed to things like acid. So it's just a notion of mine. Um, but I hope that you enjoyed this work um, and that you appreciate just how fortunate we are to have someone working in these very rare materials today.